Judge Chialino, who is a retired Monroe County, that is New York Family Court Judge, a former member of the Rochester City Council, a graduate of Columbia College and Cornell Law School. He is also an ordained Roman Catholic permanent deacon of the Diocese of Rochester, New York, with a master's degree in theology from St. Bernard's School of Theology and Ministry. And he and his wife, Gloria, live in the Rochester, New York area, where in addition to serving as, um, I believe, a jail chaplain, he also works as an instructor in an interfaith adult study program entitled The 2000 Year Road to the Holocaust, an interfaith project of the greater Rochester community. The book, and he is available for book signing, entitled The Holocaust, The Church, and the Law of Unintended Consequences, How Christian Anti-Judaism Spawned Nazi Anti-Semitism, a Judge's Verdict, was awarded the 2013 Independent Publisher Book Award the silver medal in world history. We are truly honored to have him tonight, and he is, in addition, uh, a very recognized author of the Network of the Jewish Book Council. So the title of your speech, I believe, is Words Have Consequences, and I look forward so much to uh, hearing from you. Thank you so much. Italian-American Catholic wound up becoming a deacon and wrote a book critical of the church. The preface of the book tells you the whole story. Um, basically, it started when I was in the, uh, the eighth grade and uh, kind of evolved naturally. And uh, the book is the product of that evolution. And uh, the fact that uh, probably from the time I was in eighth grade and read the diary of Anne Frank, the whole issue of how the Holocaust could have happened has troubled me. And uh, then when I uh, you know, went to Columbia and eventually went to law school and uh, eventually went to, to graduate school, I learned a little bit about the history of my church. I was further troubled um, when I realized that uh, the Holocaust, you need to understand, happened not only in Germany, but in all of Europe. And when you recognize that Europe is a cradle of Christianity and Europe was 95% Christian. Um, that was particularly troubling. But when I, when I retired after 20 years on the bench, I finally had an opportunity to look into the, uh, the question and also had an opportunity. I had the time, quite frankly, because I, I was all of a sudden retired. And uh, the book is what came of that. But in any event, Abraham Joshua Heschel once said, the Holocaust did not begin at Auschwitz. The Holocaust began with words. And too many of those impactful words were written or spoken by Christians. Church leaders, theologians, preachers, teachers, and ordinary people for close to 2,000 years. Words obviously have consequences, especially when they lead to action which can be for good or evil. It is an indisputable fact of history that the Roman Catholic Church, my church, and subsequently founded churches harbored a powerful anti-Jewish bias which became a source of evil. And that's the premise of my book. The Holocaust, the Church, and the Law of Unintended Consequences. How Christian anti-Judaism spawned Nazi anti-Semitism, a judge's verdict. This is written as a judge, which I did for 20 years. I was determined before I began the process to assemble the evidence weigh the evidence, and then render verdict, render judgment, and this book is my verdict. And also I was determined that the chips would fall where they may. I was hoping that I would be able to exonerate my church from the complicity of the Holocaust. Pope Pius XII, for example, was the wartime pope. 
But as you will see from the title, I wasn't able to do that. Now, grounded in scripture and the writings of the earliest theologians, the church fathers, this bias, this 2,000 year old bias, is termed anti Judaism. And it was a deeply ingrained theological position of the church, permeating two of its core doctrines. Doctrine number one God rejected, the, the doctrine is called supersessionism. God rejected the Jews and unilaterally revoked God's covenants with them. Christians became the new chosen people. Christianity fulfilled and replaced Judaism, rendering Judaism insignificant in salvation history. This doctrine is called supersessionism or replacementism. Doctrine number two, collective guilt. All Jews from the first century forward are responsible for the death of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, and the Son of God. Okay, so supersessionism, collective guilt. The two core doctrines on which anti-Judaism, bias against Jews based on the religion, came to be. In the New Testament, certain passages are misread to justify persecution of Jews. The favorite text of Jew haters comes from the Gospel of Matthew, written about 70 in the Common Era. In the Passion narrative of Matthew, during the trial scene before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, the Jewish crowd is portrayed as responding to Pilate's protestation of Jesus' innocence by proclaiming, quote, his blood, Jesus' blood, be on us and our children. Rather, this is what the crowd says to Pilate. Pilate washes his hands and says, this man, I am, I am washing my hands of this innocent man's blood. And the crowd is portrayed as saying, his blood, Jesus' blood be on us and on our children. That's Matthew 27, 25. Now, based on the collective guilt embedded in those words, Christians have maligned and mistreated Jews for almost two millennia. And no other biblical verse has been responsible for so much violence and bloodshed directed against them. Now the tendency to exonerate the Romans and fix blame on the Jews for Jesus' crucifixion, his death, intensified as early Christian missionary activity expanded into the ancient Mediterranean world to make converting non-Jews or Gentiles easier and less threatening to the ruling authority of the Romans. Roman involvement in the crucifixion was diminished as Jewish involvement culpability increased. And this is illustrated, for example, in the Gospel of Peter, widely read by some second century Christians, but not included in the New Testament canon. The New Testament canon is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The author of the Gospel of Peter, he wrote this, the Jews, the elders and the priests realized after the crucifixion how much evil they had done to themselves and began beating their breasts saying, woe to us, because of our sins. The judgment and the end of Jerusalem are near. Now the last phrase, the judgment and the end of Jerusalem are near, echoes the charge made by early Christian theologians that the destruction of Jerusalem in the second temple in 70 CE signified God's judgment on the Jewish people for their rejecting Jesus as Messiah and killing him. Now remember, the Gospel of Peter was written in the second century, talking about an event that happened in the first century. So it was looking at that event with the benefit of hindsight and retrojecting into that event a reason to hate Jews. 
God was punishing them for what they did. Now, in the first letter to the Thessalonians, which was written about 52 in the Common Era, the oldest known Christian document, St. Paul declares, For you, brothers and sisters, become imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffer the same things from your own compatriots as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They displeased God and opposed everyone by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. Words have consequences. And what I'm doing for you is giving you some representative samples of words that go back to the first century. In Paul's letter to the Romans, written circa 56 CE, the author refers to Jews as those to whom God has given, quote, a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to the very day. The Gospel of John, written between 90 to 100, quotes Jesus as saying this, you Jews, we need to understand that Jesus was a Jew, but nonetheless, words were put in his mouth, you Jews are of your father the devil, and you choose to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. This is the Gospel of John, one of the four Gospels of the New Testament. Now, the not-so-subtle message of the four Gospels and other books of the New Testament is quite clear. The Jews are sinister evildoers, purposely, who purposely murdered the Lord, their God killers, their deicides, and most scripture scholars agree that this is a misinterpretation, a misinterpretation of the biblical text, which resulted from reading the words without regard to their Jewish context. Without regard to their Jewish context. Fundamentalist Christians, literalist Christians, read the words word for word for what it says. This is an example of how you can go wrong, astray, by doing that. A misinterpretation of biblical texts helps explain why anti-Jewish animus, hatred, which is incidentally termed the world's oldest hatred, which predates Christianity. Why this animus permeates the writings of the earliest theologians, the Church Fathers, Polycarp, Justin Martyr, St. Jerome, and Tertullian, just to name a few. I've read, from, I've read selected passages from Scripture, and I'm going to read to you selected passages from the early Church Fathers, the early theologians who set Christianity on the path that... Um, that resulted in the Holocaust in the case of the Jews. Now, the primary motivation of these early church leaders was fear that the newly baptized Christians, converts to Christianity, would fall back into their Jewish ways, because the early, earliest converts were, of course, Jews. Or that Gentile converts would find the practices of Judaism preferable to those of Christianity. Now, to combat the so-called Judaizing, of Christianity, the Church Fathers wrote and preached against Judaism in often venomous and inflammatory words. Words have consequences, right? Both for good or ill. Now, when read today, and I'm going to read you a representative sample, these words are still stark and chilling. Jews, for example, were referred to as evil, as vermin, as unclean and as unfit to live. Unfit to live. If you go through this exhibit, this excellent exhibit from the U.S. Holocaust Museum, you will see where in the 20th century the words unfit to live became a part of the euthanasia program. And those words were first uttered in the 
second, third, and fourth century. Now these are words widely used in Nazi propaganda, for example, the euthanasia program. Hitler, in his autobiography and political manifesto, Mein Kampf, first published in 1925, he advocates for the elimination of Jews from Germany and Europe to prevent defilement of Aryan blood and the corruption of European culture, referring to them as vermin, maggots, polluters, destroyers of Aryan humanity, and life on the, on the unworthy to live. No one railed against Judaism more vehemently than St. John Chrysostom, the fourth century Archbishop of Constantinople and the doctor of the church. He was known for his eloquence in preaching and in public speaking. In fact, Chrysostom is Greek for golden throat, the golden tongue. This is what he said, among other things. The synagogue is a brothel, a hiding place for unclean beasts. Jews are the most worthless of all men, who are lecherous, greedy, and rapacious, perfidious murderers of Christ, and for killing God, there is no expiation possible, no indulgence, no pardon. Christians may never cease vengeance. Jews must live in servitude forever. God always hated Jews. It is incumbent upon all Christians to hate Jews. And these words were spoken in the fourth century. In 388, a mob of Christians, at the instigation of their bishop, looted and burned the synagogue in Kalkinicum, a town on the Euphrates River in modern-day Syria. In the same year, St. Ambrose, a doctor of the church, defended the righteousness of synagogue burning. The righteousness of synagogue burning. Kristalna. How many of you know what Kristalna is? Okay, November, what, 8, 9, 1938? Most historians say the Holocaust began on Kristalna. What did it include besides the shattering of glass? And burning of synagogues. The burning of synagogues. So in the 20th century, the word spoken in the fourth came to pass. And of course, synagogues were burned right throughout history. St. Augustine, also a doctor of the church, wrote that Jews possess the mark of Cain, whom God requires to wander the earth in perpetual servitude, the wandering Jew until they voluntarily, voluntarily convert to Christianity. Referring to Jews as slave librarians who exist for the salvation of the nation, but not the, for their own salvation, Augustine wrote, the church admits and avows the Jewish people to be cursed because after killing Christ, they continue in impiety and unbelief. Not only did they commit the arch crime of deicide, but they refused to repent and they refused to convert to Christianity. And who but the Jews should know that they were killing Jesus, who was clearly foretold in the Old Testament? Well, those of you who know the Old Testament know that it's somewhat of a stretch to see a Jesus foretold, the Jesus of history foretold in the now this prayer for the conversion of Jews was recited during Catholic Masses until 1955. I remember this, I was born in 45, so I was up to 10 years old, and I remember this prayer being read or said in all Masses. Let us pray also for the perfidious Jews. Now this is 19, up to 1955, 10 years after the end of the, the Holocaust. Let us pray also for the perfidious Jews that Almighty God may remove the veil from their hearts so that they too may acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. Almighty and eternal God, who does not exclude from your mercy even Jewish perfidiousness, faithlessness, hear our prayers which we offer for the blindness of that people 
that acknowledge the light of your truth, which Christ they may be delivered from their darkness. 2.19.55. And it wasn't until Vatican Council II that the church believed that the only way to salvation was the Roman Catholic Church. Protestants were heretics. All other faiths were bogus. And error has no rights because the only way to heaven is to be Roman Catholic. Pronouncements of church councils. So I've talked to you about scripture. I've talked to you about early theologians, the, the church fathers, words spoken about Jews. Now I'm going to tell you about pronouncements of church councils and synods of bishops, which were likewise saturated with this anti-Judaism. Animus against Jews based on their religion, on their faith. For example, in 306, with the common era, the Council of Elvira decreed that Christians and Jews were forbidden to marry or have sexual intercourse or even to eat together. The Council of Nicaea in 325 decreed that Easter and Passover would henceforth be celebrated on different days. Why? Let us have nothing in common with this odious people. And to this day, Passover and Easter never happen on the same day. In 337, the marriage of a Jewish man to a Christian woman became punishable by death. And that still happens in the Middle East, by the way. If you convert, if a Christian or a Muslim converts to Christianity, the Muslim who converted, the prostitute, an apostate can be can be killed. In 339, converting to Judaism became a criminal offense. So if a Christian converted, converted to Judaism, it was a capital offense, which again happens in the Middle East uh, under Sharia law. The Synod of Toledo, 681, ordered the burning of the Talmud and other Jewish books. The burning of the Talmud and other Jewish books. Who knows what happened on May 10th of 1933 in Opera Square across from Humboldt University in Berlin. Well, the Nazis staged their first book burning of Jewish authors <clears throat> and of non-Jews suspected of writing in the Jewish spirit. Even of non-Jews suspected of writing in the Jewish spirit. And similar events took place in other cities in Germany and elsewhere throughout the Third Reich. So Hitler didn't invent the burning of Jewish books. Secular rulers, with church approval, barred Jews from, among other things, owning real estate, holding public office or civil service positions, attending public schools or universities, hiring Christian servants, and practicing certain professions. Now, because church doctrine forbade Christians to practice usury, lending money at interest, Jews became bankers which created for them an opportunity to become the dominant financiers of Europe. Even kings and popes borrowed from Jewish bankers. Involvement in banking, however, linked Jews to the story of Judas Iscariot, who, according to Christian tradition, betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And that, of course, fed the stereotype, a stereotypical prejudice that Jews were venal money grubbers. They couldn't do anything right. In 1205, Pope Innocent III wrote this. The Jews, by their own guilt, are consigned to perpetual servitude because they crucified the Lord. As slaves rejected by God and whose death they wickedly conspired, they shall, by the effect of this very action, recognize themselves as the slaves of those whom Christ's death set free. Christ's death set free? Christians who believe in him. So Jews were to be the slaves of Christians. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Right? I've been criticized for slandering my church, but you know what I say? Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just saying what's out there. The sad truth is that many of the anti-Jewish laws promulgated by the Third Reich 
and its collaborationist regimes had direct antecedents in church laws and practices. Raoul Hilden Hilberg has compiled an outline entitled Fanatical and Nazi Anti-Jewish Measures, in which he identifies 15 canon laws, church laws, with direct parables to Nazis, Nazi race laws. Now, two obvious ones, the Fourth Lateran Council, in a 1213 decree, required Jews to wear distinctive markings on their clothing. And the Synod of Breslau's decree of 1267 mandated that Jews live in ghettos. So Hitler didn't invent requiring Jews to wear the Star of David to identify themselves as Jews, nor did he invent the creation of a thousand ghettos or so in the Greater Third Reich to keep them until they could be exterminated. Now, I, this is the Catholic Church, but the, the Catholic Church was the only game in town until the Protestant Reformation, right? So now let me talk about Martin Luther. And this book primarily talks about the Catholic Church because that was my focus. But 16th century Protestant, Protestant reformer Martin Luther, a, a, a German native son, although initially sympathetic toward Jews, became rapidly anti-Jewish in his later years, angered by their refusal to convert to Christianity. Now let me say something about conversion to Christianity. If Jews converted to Christianity, that, under the scheme of doctrine, would make it okay. In fact, it was only when Jews, all Jews, converted to Christianity that the second coming, now you guys are waiting for a first coming, we're waiting for a second coming, but the second coming couldn't come until the Jews recognized Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So theoretically, converting to Christianity would make everything better. The only problem is in the Third Reich, it didn't matter if you converted because it was in your genes, your blood, and that wouldn't change. Edith Stein, I don't have time to go into that, but Edith Stein is a case in point. Okay, but in any event, Luther was angered by the refusal to convert, and he wrote in a scathing tract entitled On the Jews and Their Lies, and in this tract, Jews are depicted as Christ killers, deicides, and criminals bent on ruling the world. Now, this ruling the world canard has been around since the Middle Ages. It wasn't invented by the protocol, you know, the Russians and the protocols of the elders of Zion. It just picked up on tradition that was already there. Luther advocated burning synagogues, right? Now, where have we heard that before? In the fourth century, right? Burning schools and homes and driving Jews like mad dogs out of the, the land, expelling them from Europe, for example. The Nazis prominently displayed this tract. Now, remember, Luther was a, a German native son they displayed the track, the track in a special glass case at not, uh, National Socialist Party rallies, at uh, the Nuremberg rallies. And Hitler was particularly fond of quoting from that tract, as he quoted from Matthew and various other scripture or, uh, or uh, church, uh, uh, you know, church proclamations through the years. In 1870, now we're in the 19th century, Pope Pius IX, who is blessed, he's been beatified. He's on his way to becoming a, 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 a saint, perhaps. He's the one, uh, have you heard of the name Edgardo Mortara? A Jewish boy was baptized because his nurse thought that he was going to die and go to hell. To go to hell. So she baptized him. This bit of information came to the attention of the Holy Inquisition. Well, canon law in those days said that a Christian child could not be raised by a non-Christian parent. So, blessed Pope Pius IX had the boy kidnapped from his parents, and the child was taken to a house of catechumens. To make a long story short, regardless of what the parents, you know, their entreaties to have the child return was not, the child was eventually adopted by the Pope, grew up to be ordained a priest, and turned his back on the children, on, on, on his parents. But in any event, this is what Pope uh, Pius IX said. Jews had been children of God in the house, or ch had been children in the house of God, 
in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible. But all that changed. For owing to their obstinacy and failure to believe, they became dogs. Okay, now this is 1870, around the time of the unification of Italy. And the, the Catholic press. Let me tell you some things that have been uh, written in the Catholic press. In 1880, the founding editor of La Civiltà Cattolica, a prominent Italian Jewish newspaper, the founding editor, Father Giuseppe Aurelia, wrote this in an article. This is 1880. The Jews, eternal insolent children, obstinate, dirty, thieves, liars, ignoramuses, pests, and scourge of those near and far, managed to lay their hands on all public wealth, and virtually alone they took control not only of all the money, all the public wealth, but they virtually, but of the law itself in those countries. They took control of the, the wealth and of the law itself in those countries where they've been allowed to hold public offices. Yet they complain at the first shout of anyone who dares to raise his voice against this barbarian invasion by an enemy race hostile to Christianity and to society in general. In the latter half of the 18th century, anti-Semitism, hatred of Jews based on their race, their DNA, the genetic makeup, is coming into the fore. And that language, the anti-Semitic language, is starting to permeate the Catholic press. Lo <laughs> Zulvatore Romano, the Vatican Daily newspaper, in 1906 defended anti-Semitic mobs protesting the reversal of Jewish-French Captain Alfred Dreyfus's rigged conviction for high treason and they wrote in the Zerbatore Romani, the Jewish race, the deicide, the God-killing people, wander throughout the world, brings with it everywhere the festiferous breath of treason. Now this is the beginning of the 20th century. And this, these words, words have consequences. Words that have been in the lexicon of Christianity for 1900 years are still being spoken and uttered. Now, the term anti-Semitism, first coined by German author Wilhelm Marr in 1879. Nobody spoke of anti-Semitism before 1979. But this new pseudoscience of anti-Semitism purported to explain why Jews should be reviled as defined by their race as opposed to their religion. Go through this exhibit, you'll see that it coincides with the euphenics, you know, the, the cleansing of the races. And it, it elides nicely into what was going on in the early 20th century. Now, adopting an extreme version of anti Semitism, Nazi propaganda depicted Jews not only as an inferior race, but a demonic race whose threat could only be eradicated by complete elimination from the greater Third Reich, envisioned to encompass all of Europe, including Great Britain and the Soviet Union. Now, admittedly, Nazi racist ideology differed from previous anti-Jewish traditions, which, as I said, predated Christianity. But Hitler needed to build on that tradition that pre animus tradition, pre-anti-Semitic tradition, in order for his virulent brand of racism to gain popular acceptance. And when the Nazi war machine was pouring out their message, it was drawing on the groundwater of what had been there since the first century. So, anti-Judaism based on religion not only spawned anti-Semitism based on race, but spawned genocidal Nazi anti-Semitism. And that's the subtitle of my book. Now, you need to understand that the Vatican contests that. Okay, this is what the Vatican says. The Shoah, the catastrophe, the Holocaust, was the work of a thoroughly neo-pagan regime, the Nazis, its anti-Semitism had its roots outside of Christianity. This is the official position of my church to this day. So, I speculate that when 
the medical, New York Medical College, was affiliated with the Archdiocese of New York, there is no way yours truly would be speaking to an audience of the medical college. Right? Trust me on that. Now, early in his political career, a career in 1923, Hitler proclaimed the Jews a race, not, but not human. So Hitler's picking up on this you know, pseudo-scientific, uh, social Darwinistic, Nietzsche is, he's drawing from what's already there. Holding them responsible for Germany's defeat in World War I, right, the stab in the back. Why did the German army, the Weimar, why did they lose World War I? Because they were stabbed in the back by the Jews. And for the humiliating terms of the Versailles Treaty, not only were they responsible for the loss of the war, but they were responsible for the, the Versailles Treaty, which everybody in Germany hated. Scapegoating them also, they were scapegoated for the, the chaotic social and economic conditions of the Weimar Republic. Accusing them of conspiring to rule the world and promoting Bolshevism, right? The communist uh, revolution happened in 1917 and, and Russia pulled out of the war. Uh, during World War I. Within 10 years, Hitler would begin to systematically strip Jews, <clears throat> by reason of the scapegoating, of their civil, social, and economic, and also human rights in Germany. He came to power in January of 1933. Months into his chancellorship, he started the campaign that would end in the final solution. In January 1939, two months after Kristallnacht, Kristallnacht happened in November of 1938. In January, November 1938, January 1939, two months after Kristallnacht, by the way, what was the official Vatican reaction to Kristallnacht? Silence. But in any event, Following passage of the Manifesto of Italian Racism, and Mussolini, as you know, was Hitler's uh, ally under the, in the Axis, Germany passed the Nuremberg Laws of 1935. Italy, fascist Italy, passed the Manifesto of Italian Racism in 1939, which did just about the same thing to Italian Jews as happened to German Jews under the Nuremberg Laws. But there was a, an article in L'Osservatore Romano, the mouthpiece of the Vatican. And in this uh, article, an Italian bishop, his sermon referencing these new laws was published. And I'm going to read you what it said. On January 1939, Hitler invaded Poland in September of 1939. This is the Vatican newspaper referencing the anti-Jewish Italian uh, fascist anti-Jewish laws. The church has always regarded living side by side with Jews, as long as they remain Jews, as dangerous to the faith and the tranquility of the Christian people. It is for this reason that you find an old and long tradition of church legislation and of law and discipline intended to break and limit the action and influence of Jews in the midst of Christians and the contact of Christians with them, isolating the Jews and not allowing them to exercise those offices and professions in, in which they would dominate or influence the spirit, the education, and the customs of Christians. So Jews need to be kept away from Christians for their own protection and for the protection of Christians. This is 1939. Right? The Lancy Conference was in 1941, the final solution. And shortly after the invasion of Poland, and the move east in Operation Barbarossa, the Holocaust would begin in earnest. First, a Holocaust by bullets, right? As the Weimar went eastward toward Russia, there would be these squads that would come into these Eastern European towns, round up all the people, bring them out or march them out to the uh, you know, woods, have them dig their own graves and, and shoot them before the first crematoria started spewing out smoke, more than a million and a half Jews had died by 
by bullets or other means. In 1938, Hitler, a nominal Roman Catholic, he was baptized a Catholic, and he, he was he was nominal, he was amoral. I mean, he was not clearly he was not a practicing Catholic, but he was a baptized Catholic. And he masterfully exploited religion. He told his minister of justice, Hans Frank, that it was his, Hitler's destiny, to fulfill the curse imposed by Jews on themselves in the New Testament. And he quoted Matthew 27. 25. His blood be upon us and on our children. So he was going to carry out what the Jews, the curse the Jews imposed on themselves at the trial before Pontius Pilate in the first century. Now, in 1939, Roberto Farinacci, a member of Mussolini's fascist grand council, while speaking on the subject, the Jews in the church said this. <coughs> We fascist Catholics, Italian Catholics, consider the Jewish problem from a strictly political point of view. It's only business, nothing personal. A strictly political point of view. But it comforts our souls to know that if as Catholics we became anti-Semites, we owe it to the teachings that the church has promulgated over the past 20 centuries. Now this is a fascist leader in, in Mussolini the government talking in 1939. Words do indeed have consequences for good or ill. Joseph Goebbels, also a nominal Catholic, right, Minister of Propaganda, drawing on his upbringing, wrote this in his diary. Christ is the genius of love, as such the most diametrical opposite of Judaism, which is the incarnation of hate. The Jew is a non-race among the races of the earth. Christ is the first great enemy of Jews. That is why Judaism had to get rid of him. For he was shaking the very foundation of its future international power. So Goebbels is saying that the Jews, as they were attempting to bring down you know, Jesus, were already plotting to take over the world in the 20th century. The Jew is the lie personified. When he crucified Christ, he crucified every everlasting truth for the first time in history. <coughs> Der Giflitz. Anybody here speak German? Der Giflitz. The poisonous mushroom. One of many, many, many anti-Semitic books written for German children. Highlighting the theme of Jews as Christ killers, it urged, Ger uh, Ger it urged German children, quote, whenever you see a cross, then think of the horrible murder by the Jews on Golgotha, the place of the crucifixion. So the Nazis were in, in, indoctrinating little Nazis from the time, you know, frankly, they, they, they exited the womb. And by the time they got to be ready to fight, they were ready. In May of 1941, okay, now, uh, the Wannsee Conference happened later in 1941, the final solution. An article was written by a priest in Croatia, a Roman Catholic priest in Croatia, part of the then Yugoslavia. Why are the Jews persecuted was the name of the article, was the, the, the title of the article, and it appeared in the diocesan newspaper. And this is what he said. The descendants of those who hated Jesus, persecuted, persecuted him to death, crucified him, and persecuted his disciples are guilty of sins greater than those of their forebearers Jewish greed increases. This is 1941, right, as Jews are being killed by bullets at this point. The Jews have led Europe and the world throughout to disaster, moral and economic disaster. They're being scapegoated for the war. And what's going on, you know, among the populace as Hitler is moving east? Their appetite grows till only domination of the world will satisfy it. Satan aided them in the invention of socialism and communism. The church viewed Hitler as leading a crusade against communism, as an aside. The, the article goes on. There is a limit to love. The movement of, liber of the liberation of the world from Jews is a movement for the renewal of human dignity. Omniscient and omnipotent God stands behind this movement. 
So this is a Roman Catholic priest in 1941 as World War II rages in Europe saying that what is going on regarding the Jews is God's work because Adolf Hitler is carrying out God's plan for the Jews. In the Ukraine, the Holocaust was carried out mostly in Eastern Europe. It wasn't happenstance that most of the killing camps were in Poland. That's where anti-Judaism, anti-Semitism was most virulent in the Ukraine. Six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. A thousand Jews, or a hundred thousand Jews, were killed in the 17th century in Poland by the Cossacks, the Kimunetsky massacre, right? This is Eastern Europe. This is what a Ukrainian priest preached in a sermon in May of 1942. Dear merciful people, I beg you and warn you, do not give a piece of bread to a Jew. No trace of a Jew is to remain. We should erase them from the face of the earth. When the last Jew disappears from the face of the earth, we will win the war. This is 1942, right? The crematoriums have started doing their work. In June of 1944, as Hungarian Jews were being rounded up and deported to Auschwitz, and as Germany was clearly losing the war, by this point of the war, they were losing in the East. There was no question they were going to lose the war. An article appeared in the local fascist newspaper, the Arrow Cross, in the town called Vesprum, announcing an upcoming Thanksgiving prayer service. This is June of 1944, right? In, in a year, the war is going to be over. This is what the, uh, the article said. With the help of divine providence, our ancient city and promise has been liberated from Judaism because the Jews have been deported to Auschwitz, <coughs> which sullied our nation. In our thousand-year history, this is not the first time that we have been freed from some scourge which has befallen us. <coughs> However, no previous event can compare in its importance to this event. For no previous foe threatening us, the Jews were threatening the Hungarians as they're being rounded up and just about destroyed as the people hungered. However, no previous event can compare the importance of this event, for no previous foe threatening us, whether by force or by political takeover, has ever succeeded in overcoming to the extent that the Jews have succeeded. And with the aid of their poisoned roots which penetrated our national body and took hold of it, we are following in the footsteps of our fathers and coming to express our thanks to God who saves us whenever we are in distress. Come and gather for the Thanksgiving service which will take place on June 25th, 11.30 a.m. in the Franciscan Church. They're thanking God as the Jews are being deported to Auschwitz. Clearly, in my mind, clearly, anti-Judaism contributed to the culpability, complicity, and indifference of so many, many Europeans during the Holocaust. And as I said, or mentioned earlier, Europe was 95% Christian. 95% Christian. Germany was 44% Catholic. The balance was mostly Protestant. If you study the Holocaust, recognizing the Holocaust happened in Europe, how can you but conclude that the Holocaust was something that Christians did to Jews? They didn't come down from Mars. These were not alien people. These were Christians. Which gives me no pleasure to announce, pronounce, and yet it, it needs to be spoken, it needs to be said because a lot of Christians don't want to acknowledge it, right? They don't want to believe it. Elie Wiesel said Christianity died at Auschwitz. Think about that. Christianity died at Auschwitz. As these priests are saying, do not give a morsel of bread to a Jew, or, or they're, they're advising you know, turning your neighbor to it, 
Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. Love one another unconditionally. There's, there's a serious disconnect, and this is what I talk about in the conclusion of the book. There's a serious disconnect between what was being preached and what Christians were doing during this time in, uh, you know, of history. Nineteen hundred plus years of targeted animus against Jews had conditioned condition Christians to view them as objects. They were objectified, outside the circle of Christian concern, excluded from the ambit of Jesus' command to love one another as I have loved you. Right? That command, love one another as I have loved you, didn't apply to Jews because Jews didn't, didn't fit. They were outside the circle of Christian concern. And I quote a letter of Eugenio Pacelli's, the future Pius XII, saying those very words. He was concerned about converts, Jewish converts, to, to Christianity. But those who had not converted were outside the circle of Christian concern. And those words were written in 1933-34. It's in the book. This conditioning in effect, anesthetize Christian conscience to injustice against Jews, dulling Christian capacity to feel empathy for them, ethically desensitized collective <coughs> conscience, ethically desensitized collective conscience, caused too many Europeans, including church leaders, to succumb to Nazi anti-Semitism, at least in its early milder form, with some even willing to become perpetrators in its final, most virile form. And for close to 2,000 years, Jews, Jews have been, had been objectified and dehumanized to the point where 20th century Christians so inclined were enabled to murder them individually or as a group. Now, I don't want you to leave the impression that every Christian did nothing or was a perpetrator. Because despite the passivity of most European Christians and active participation of others, Clearly there were, in Germany and every Nazi-occupied or allied country, people, clergy, religious, and laity alike, who rejected Nazi anti-Semitism and behaved humanely, even heroically, toward the Jews. And these good people, despite considerable peril to themselves and their families, bore witness that compassion and decency still existed in what had become hell on earth. 12 years of the thousand year right. These good people provided rays of light in the darkness of profound depravity. Among other things, they joined resistance movements, they sheltered children and adults in their homes, convents, and schools. They concealed and provided for individuals or entire families. They established underground passage routes to neutral countries. They provided false baptismal certificates or travel documents. They shed their meager provisions, and they refrained from denouncing their Jewish neighbors to the Reich authorities. And Yad Vashem, righteous Gentiles, righteous among the nation, through 2010, close to 24,000 Christians were uh, recognized as risking their lives to save Jews. So yes, there were Christians who did the right thing who did attempt to live Jesus' gospel of love. And we should celebrate them and credit them, to be sure. Unhappily, there should have been more. The Holocaust, also known as the Shoah or catastrophe, was a systematic, state-organized persecution and murder of six million Jews, including 1.5 million children by Nazi Germany and its European collaborators. It wasn't just the Germans. Also targeted 11 million members of other groups, including Poles, Catholic Poles, 2.5 million of them, and other Slavic people, homosexuals, gypsies, Jehovah Witnesses, Freemasons, people with disabilities, that's what your exhibit is about, Communist, social democrats, socialist, and political dissidents. With poison gas, bullets, the noose, 
knives, combustion, engine, exhaust, clubs, fists, disease, starvation, forced marches, and overwork. The perpetrators of the Holocaust slaughtered two-thirds of Europe's Jews and one-third of world Jewry. And if Hitler had had more time, he would have killed more. As the guns were being heard of the Nazis or the Soviets approaching the death camps, they were still killing people. They were still putting people on forced marches. Such was the level of the hatred and the zeal with which they were attempting to accomplish their work. Now, on April 8, 1965, 20 years after the Holocaust ended, 20 years after the Holocaust ended, the Vatican Council II published its 16th document, the Declaration on the Relationship of the Church and Non-Christian Religions, Nostra Etate, in our age. And in this document, abandoning close to 2,000 years of religious intolerance, the Church finally committed itself to religious freedom. Most Catholics are unaware that until Vatican Council II in 1965, the Roman Catholic Church was against religious tolerance, religious freedom, because it alone had the truth and everybody else was wrong. Protestants were heretics until 1965. After the Council, Popes Paul VI, John Paul II, Benedict XVI publicly proclaimed Religious freedom is a fundamental right, but it took 1,900 years. A proclamation that would have violated existing church doctrine until 1965. Previously, in the document Decree on Religious Liberty, Dignitatis Humanis of the Dignity of the Human Person, the Council sanctioned for the first time the separation of church and state, the right to worship according to one's conscience and the privacy of conscience over obedience to external authority. The privacy of conscience over obedience to external authority. If Catholic conscience were functioning as it should have been, if the church had helped form the conscience of Catholics with regard to Jews are God's children just like everybody else's, when Europe was 95% Christian? Vatican Council II, in short, repudiated and reversed anti-Judaism. It declared, quote, mindful of her common patrimony with the Jews and motivated by the gospel's spiritual love and by no political considerations, she deplores the hatred, persecutions, and displays of anti-Semitism directed against the Jews at any time and from any source. Specifically, Nostra Aetate declared, there is no collective guilt to be attributed to Jews past or present for the death of Jesus. So the doctrine, the 1900 plus year doctrine of collective judgment or collective guilt is in the ash pit of history. God's covenants with the Jewish people continue to be valid and they're not revoked. No more supersessionism, at least on that issue. The Jews are not forsaken and condemned by God Anti-Semitism is a sin and has no place in Christianity. Now, despite the declaration of Nostratate, however, that Christ's death could not be blamed on Jews at that time or today, would it surprise you that a recent survey by the Anti-Defamation League determined that 26% of Americans still believe that Jews were responsible for the death of Christ? Would it surprise you if I told you that? Yeah. Well, it's down. The percentage is down. It was 31% in 2011. But it still accounts for over a quarter of the people of America. And guess what? They did it in Poland, and it's, the numbers are even worse. Now, contemporary American author Jody Picoult has written, words are like eggs dropped from great heights. You can no more call them back than ignore the mess they leave when they fall. How is it possible for one group of people, Christians, to hate another group rapidly enough to slaughter six million of them? It all be
began with words, which resulted in a toxic mess of epic proportions. Thank you. after Labor Day. Uh, for those who haven't been at the college before, we were founded in 1860. We moved to Westchester in 1971. We're a health sciences university that grants doctoral and master's degrees in medicine and public health and physical therapy, master's degrees in speech pathology, and master of uh, public health. We will be opening a dental school, a nursing school, a PA program, and a master's of science in medical ethics. You are in the Skyline building, which used to be an IBM building, which we purchased last year and repurposed as an academic building. Uh, please be sure to have something to eat. Uh, for anyone concerned about dietary laws, everything is OU. We have an on-site mashkiach. Uh, the floor will be open for a conversation. I would propose that we take about 10 minutes for 15 minutes for a general conversation. Then our guests will be here to sign books and talk to you. Individually, please, if you have a question, raise your hand so you can be called on. Please be sure it actually is a question, or if it's a comment, a brief comment so everyone can participate. Uh, and uh, the floor is open for a conversation. Question. Dr. Newman. Yes. I was surprised that you didn't mention the Inquisition at all. It's in the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's 2,000 years of, of history, and uh, I, I tried, you know, the book is 294 pages, so I attempted to include as much of it as possible, and in 45 minutes, which turned out to be 60 minutes, you didn't have a chance to, you're right. And guess what? The Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith, which exists today, and is um, giving the sisters, you know, the, you know, for those of you who were know what's going on. The, the, the League of Women Religious uh, is under an investigation of this, this group, and the Good Sisters uh, are being accused of, of following the social gospel too carefully and not doing enough about some of the issues that the bishops want to talk about. To make a long story short, the Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith is what the Holy Inquisition was, and it became through history. Needless to say, the name was changed through history, but the, the policing of orthodoxy continues in the Catholic Church, except they're not burning people at the stake. And if you want to know an example, usually when I speak at these uh, functions, somebody will ask, have you heard from your local diocese? Have you heard from the Vatican? Well, for the first 10 months through October of last year, the answer was no, no. In October, I got the answer. I'm a deacon in good standing. However, my faculty to preach, my permission to preach and to teach on issues of religion has been withdrawn, summarily withdrawn. I asked for a hearing, and it was denied. So, yes, the, you know, they're not burning people at the stake, thank God, but they're still trying to police orthodoxy. And the claim is that I don't understand well enough in the orthodoxy of the church, particularly the Petrine Doctrine, Papal infallibility. Yes. Does the church uh, still routinely teach the Gospels of Matthew, John, and Peter? And if so, or any of the conversations regarding the um, the depiction of Jewry has it changed? Yeah, you're right. The answer to this question is absolutely. The, the Gospels have changed <coughs> the way they're interpreted and the way. Um, when I was in uh, uh, studying my master's in theology and took my uh, the course on homiletics about preaching, there's there are guidelines as to how you refer to the Jews and what you say and what you should not say. But notwithstanding that, in Poland, for example, they're still hearing stuff that can be considered a throwback to the battle days. So yes, the church now is attempting to take back some of the, the sting, but you know, you go to a, a, a Good Friday Mass and uh, the liturgy still has Guilt be on us and on our children. They're still saying it. The crowd is still saying it. So. Right. Okay. Yes. Please. Um, I'm going to make one comment and then ask a question. When it comes to 
comment is that <clears throat> the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in uh, Germany was um, charged with the task of finding proof that <clears throat> Jews were a race. They could not. Had they been able to, we would have that document. You're talking about Holocaust deniers? Or, or? No, no, no. I'm talking about the fact that Hitler and <clears throat> Poland uh, uh, perpetuated the idea, you mentioned it too, that Jews were a race. A race? A race. There is no... There's no Jewish race, no. There's no Jewish blood. There's no Jewish blood. They could not identify this, which angered um, the Nazis. The other thing I want to ask you is... Don't confuse them with facts. <laughs> Don't confuse the reading with facts. I mean, Dr. Hopper could tell us that Judaism is not a race. Right. Well, but there's no such thing as Jewish blood, though. Well, there's no, that, that, that's it exactly. You've got the Ashkenazi, you've got the Sephardic, you've got, you know, Jews from, from Africa. You, you, can't you can convert to Judaism. I mean, it's <laughs> not, just not a race. And, um, the question I wanted to ask you is, would, um, had Benedict been able to hmm, have a, a longer reign, a healthier reign, perhaps, do you see that um, some of the efforts Voting, uh, dispelling the anti Judaism. Do you think that would have risen up again under Benedict? I mean, he did. <clears throat> he did make certain moves that spell a return to the old ways. Did yeah. he not? Yes. Vatican Council II. Benedict the Sixteenth and his predecessor John Paul II. There's an element of liberal Catholics, progressive Catholics who take the position that they were attempting to retrench and go back to the time before and get away from the spirit of Vatican II. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and there were Catholics who thought that uh, there should be a rush to name John Paul II a saint for that and other reasons. Mm -hmm. For example, his lack of, uh, or the way that uh, he handled the issue of the priest uh, pedophilia so, so we're, we institution, and I, I speak as a, a, a identified Catholic, we're no more, hmm, are we any more, are we ever going to be democratic? Are we ever going to completely eradicate some of our history? The papacy is the one of the longest running absolute monarchies and continues to be. Yeah. No, democracy, <laughs> among the things that was condemned, by uh, Pope Leo the Thirteenth was Americanism. Uh, and the church has been reactionary since most of its history. It was a legitimizer of the status quo, right? In the French Revolution, you know, some of the uh, the uh, intellectual or the aristocrats that the guillotine, they were uh, cardinals and they were bishops because they were part of the landed aristocracy. Um, when you study the history of the Catholic Church, you, you see things that are so obviously antithetical with what the gospel is supposed to be. You know, Pope Rodrigo Borgia, for example. I mean, study his papacy. Uh, you know, what HBO did a series on it, and it, although it's a little over the top, it's pretty accurate. The popes are not all saints. <laughs> or, read, or read the new book, not that new book by David Kurtzer, who wrote the kidnapping of a garden. The, garden of Christ. Christ. the Pope's it's against important. the Jews, very informative. <clears throat> right. uh, would you like to offer any comments on it's the debate over the uh, I see you we finish in a second, perhaps. Um, the debate over the canonization of Pius the Pope during the Second World War. That's another discussion. <laughs> um, it's it's when you read the book you'll see that I, um, I talk about Pius IV. But the book covers 2,000 years of history. And you could argue that by the time 19, the 1930s came into being, it was a foregone, it was gonna happen. It was the uh, kind of the, um, the perfect storm. Hitler, Nazism, the World War I, the Versailles Treaty, the whole bit. So Pius XII is like a tragic figure. Um, what I say is give him credit for what he did, but don't
don't give a pass for what he didn't do. And you've got apologists for Pius XII who basically want to give him credit for every Jew that was saved. And I think that's an overreach because there's no documentation. First, there's no documentation of numbers, and then there's no record, nothing that you can point to that says, yes, here's a directive to all the nuns and all the... And I'm telling you that I, Pius XII, am urging you to give solace and comfort to. It, it, it may have happened, but it, there's no proof of it. Professor Prattis. Um, yes, um, the, the, the book is very, very well researched, obviously, and, uh, and, and extremely thorough. And as I was getting towards the end of it, um, when you were referring to the, the inquisition of the women religious, I thought, well, here we're going into uh, some, some, very, some very interesting uh, territory. Uh, now, just to fast forward, if you had a wish list, and if you were, would have a, an idea of how to get uh, the church out from underneath this pall, uh, what would you suggest? <laughs> <laughs> go back and look at the Vatican II. I mean, if the Vatican II hadn't happened, I'd be something else. I wouldn't be a Roman Catholic. As, particularly knowing what I, I knew. You know, when, as I point out in my, in my preface, when I was 18, I thought the church could do no wrong. And if the Pope said this, it had to be so. Then I went to Columbia. And, you know, they kind of stretched my perspective. They said, believe that you will, but be open to what other people believe as well. And um, question authority. And, you know, they taught me how to think critically. The church always dissuaded people from thinking critically. Up until Vatican Council II, a Catholic was supposed to pay, pray, and obey. Pay, pray, and obey. Go to church, pray to God, you know, give your, your, your tithe, and what Father says, the Vatican on down goes. Don't ask questions. Well, there are Catholics today, thank God, that say that's wrong. That the church, I mean, anti-Judaism. How do you deal with it? How do you cope with it? And yet they're saying that anti-Judaism did not spawn anti-Semitism, that it happened outside of it. The church always condemned. Well, but study history. You know, I looked at it as a judge. You know, I, I weighed that evidence and found it not probative. You know? Um, and, is, and that, I, is there any hope? <laughs> I'd like to think so. I'd like to think so. Um, but was, I, I, don't, I don't have the answer. There was a hand, I think. Matt, did you have something you wanted to say? I thought I saw a hand in my right. Yes, sir, please. I'm going to ask a question about a topic that probably will warrant another discussion. <laughs> but it seems to me that the dots all lead to the current uh, delegitimization of Israel, the BDS movement. Do you see a connection at all? I, you look throughout history and you see a pattern of scapegoating and, and feigning and assembling, and I'm sure there's an element of that. Um, I really don't want to get into the politics of what's going on now, because I want to talk about what I know, and what I know is you know, what I've researched and what I've written in the book. And my critics, and, and I have critics, who, there was one priest in Rochester who, in his bulletin, he, he devoted a half a page in his bulletin to little old me, and he said, you know, I was um, uh, violating this, the uh, sanctity and the, uh, in the memory of Pius XII. How could I do this? And, uh, and the guy goes on, on radio, you know, to excoriate me in the book and admits he didn't read the book. <laughs> and when Catholics want to talk to me about Pius XII, I know they haven't read the book because Pius XII is like 5% of the book even before you get to Pius XII. How do you deal with the, you know, St. John Christendom and, the, and the, the Holy Inquisition? Among the people who were burned at the stake were Jews, Judaizers, and the, the Crusades. Among the people who were killed were Muslims and Jews. And guess what? Jews and Muslims were given a choice. 
convert or die. And where are we hearing this lately? History repeating itself. You, you know, but people don't know, don't realize this. But I'm not making it up. It's it's out there. Look at it. At this change of the you were talking about the uh, revolution. Well, I'm kind of turned off with the institutionalized church, as you might imagine. Are you? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I, I think I know too much. It's like in Wizard of Oz, you know, when they when they push back the curtain, it kind of takes away the illusion that the allure, the, the wizard is seen for what he is. When you study the history of the church, there are lots of things that are very troubling, and this is only a part of it. And un unhappily, the trends that I found and attribute to why things happen, they're still there. You know, why did the sex abuse scandal happen as it did? Because when you're dealing with an infallible pope or a church that can do no wrong, how do you admit that you made a mistake? How do you do? In the book, I quote uh, a pope who said, though scandal be taken at a truth, it is better to admit the truth than to deny, or to permit the scandal than to deny the truth. And with the sex abuse, the whole thing they were doing, they were trying to prevent the truth and prevent the scandal. They didn't, and kids were, I mean, it was bad enough what was done, but in the way it was handled, compounded the felony and made it worse. We can continue the conversation over coffee in Danish. We will adjourn the larger group. If anyone is interested in purchasing either our guest book or the catalog of the exhibit, our friends from the bookstore, wave. From the college bookstore are here. Uh, and perhaps we'll conclude this with a word about our next program, Diana. Our next program related exhibit is? Next Monday. have uh, posters and announcements for this next author's night. Thanks to the library for organizing it. Thanks to our guests. And please stay around to continue the conversation, but we will adjourn the formal part. And as I said, if you haven't seen the exhibit, please do. And uh, it goes without saying, thank you to the New York Federal College for inviting me, and thank you for showing up to listen. Thank you.